Um, well, hello, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Holly Martinez. I'm the Director of Programs and Advocacy at the California State Parks Foundation. And we are having another one of our, um, well, that, what I like to call Chat with Champs. And we have an incredible champion here today, none other than the wonderful Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez. Um, thank you, Assemblywoman, so much for joining us. Uh, the Assemblywoman represents District 80 of the San Diego region. She is a fierce advocate fighting for workers' rights and working families. And um, most importantly, she's an incredible state park lover. And we have been so fortunate to work with her for so many years now on key pieces of legislation and policy issues that really impact our state park system. And one of the issues that we both have a passion for is making sure that those who um, live in California um, have access to our incredible 280 state park system. Um, we have incredible natural wonders that people from around the world come to visit. But it's a shame that people who have these places in their own backyard have yet to even visit. As a woman, we hear all the time, especially from people in your district, live five minutes from a beach or five miles and have yet to even visit the incredible coastline. Um, and now that COVID has hit, um, this pandemic has taken its economic toll and its health toll. Unfortunately, most predominantly of uh, people of color, brown and black people have been hit by this incredible disparity. And when state parks were set to close and have closed and had limited access, it was really clear those who do have access and those who don't. Um, this is a really big topic. It's one that we've been talking about for years and years. And it's one that unfortunately because of the health situation and the crisis that we're in has kind of shown an ugly light on the, tr the truth of this issue. And so with this big topic, let's jump right on in. Um, Assemblywoman, what are you hearing and seeing in your own backyard? And how are you handling this current economic crisis um, as a mom and a working mom and um, somebody who has been championing this issue for a while? So I have to tell you, um, the, obviously, the closures were really tough. The stay-at-home order was tough. Um, but it was really tough on communities um, who live in compacted areas, um, who don't have their own yard, who don't have um, a, a local green space to go recreate in, and even when those were shut down. Um, and so you had a lot of kids and um, older people, too. But think about young people just cooped up into a small apartment with mul multiple other people and having no place to recreate, that was tough. And so um, it's nice to see some of the state parks reopening and all of our parks reopening. One of the big things that came up though, even in San Diego here is parking, right? So uh, the, the beach itself, for example, um, you know, in Imperial Beach, we go to Silver Strand, which is a state, a state beach, a state park. Um, it opened up, but the parking didn't, which means the access becomes very limited to those who live along the coast. Um, and so that just kind of highlighted another issue. That is our beach, if you will, a, a state beach that's local. And, and um, luckily now they have limited openings on the parking, so people can go out and you see it. I mean, we, we've spent every weekend at the beach since they've opened, and you see these family units um, that are mainly black and brown and um, enjoying the ocean because that is their that that's their park, you know, and um, and we need that access. So I think it really highlighted kind of the disparities that we have in so many communities like mine. I think people really didn't realize, like, and I would try to tell folks, like, it's tough on me. We have a very small yard, but we have a yard, you know. Um, there's nowhere locally because we live in City Heights, which is in the middle of my district. There's nowhere locally to, you know, there, there's not good sidewalks to walk down. There, there's not a lot of space to, for the kids to ride their bike or um, to go throw the football uh, unless we open up our parks. And, and so I think it, it just compounded that and we really saw um, the disparities. Right. And I think raising two young kids myself, if I didn't have, you know, a backyard or transportation to get to a park, um, I, I know the, the pressure of trying to homeschool and, you know, raise a family and work full time. And, you know, I'm lucky that I have more flexibility in my workplace than many essential workers have. And I, I think, 
you know, the question that always sort of begs at times where the budget cuts are harsh and the eco economy has, we have yet to see what that revenue is going to come back after income tax returns come in. But it's really clear to, I think, all of us as we're experiencing it, that nature is essential to our health and wellness. Um, so how do we how do we keep that fight going at a time where it feels like there are so many insurmountable barriers when it comes to funding um, to make sure that access and we continue to address these issues that that those choices match the values of helping those families who've been most impacted by COVID? What what do you what thoughts do you have, especially as people are knocking on your door and your colleagues' door to be like fund this, fund that? What advice do you have for us as advocates and champions? So in reality, you know, we did what we could. We pushed back on cuts to the state parks um, and, and we have a budget that that, that restored uh, what, what the administration had uh, presented to cut. So that's a good start. But we know that the efforts that we are making and things like transportation and um, getting folks to these parks and cutting down on the cost, that, that's going to be a while before we can revisit some of those efforts. And so I think it's um, now more than ever, it's important to look to our nonprofits um, who are investing in these types of, of programs that bring communities of color and, and low income communities to nature. Um, and, and it serves a purpose not only for the, for the kids and the families who get to experience that, but that's really our future generation that will um, decide how much we preserve and protect our natural spaces. And so I know um, we, we have some local programs that, that you know, really uh, focus on ensuring that, that low-income kids in particular have the opportunity to, um, to experience um, the outdoors. And I think we need to invest in that. Uh, and we really need to look to prop up our, our nonprofits who are doing that work until we can figure out how we are get back to a place with the state budget where we can continue to expand um, things like we were looking at, like youth bus passes that would allow kids to take the bus to the beach, you know, um, that's not going to happen right now. And, and so until we can, we've got to, you know, really push um, outdoor outreach and different programs that, that really do get to that heart. Yeah, Outdoor Outreach is definitely an incredible organization in your own backyard. And in fact, um, we have issued sort of an emergency grant round to um, a lot of nonprofits right now just to keep their doors open, keep them afloat. Many of them applied for the Triple P program, but still not being able to fundraise and do those activities. And one of the things that we're learning just in accepting all these applications are the creative and innovative way people are starting to stay true to their mission, which is helping to build that resilience in youth through outdoor experiences. And so I'm learning about um, what was big group activities turning into like maybe four to one mentoring programs, building, fostering strong bonds, um, doing virtual trips in advance to then getting outdoors. And so it's exciting to see that there is a way for the work to continue and that if we can all band together, we can make these programs happen. Now, my goal, and I hope you'll ho join me in this, is like, let's shout it from the rooftops. Let's shine a light on these incredible programs who are doing such incredible work so that they can be a model when we're at a point in the state budget and other ways to say, okay, now we need to take to scale and really blow out access in a way that makes this happen for every community that has these similar struggles. Absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, so I, I'm also just curious, like, have you, it sounds like you've been out to Silver Strand. What are you seeing from your constituents in terms of like their health concerns? And it still seems like there's this um, slight abandonment of like, okay, nobody's wearing masks when I'm going to Target to people who are still like, I haven't left my home. There's quite a range of, of families. And so what have you been seeing in your, your district? and and how can we message to communities in your district about saving, using parks safely and, and bringing those opportunities to them? Well, I really see, like in my district, which we have a disproportionate number, of course, of COVID cases. And a lot of that is arising from two different features. One, that we had more essential workers than most communities did. So while a lot of us were sheltering in place or working from home, a lot of the folks in my community actually had to go into work and expose themselves or potentially expose themselves and their families. 
um, that was a concern and it continues to be a concern. We also have um, the sheer fact of density, right? So we, we have, um, whether it's in an individual house or in a neighborhood, um, you know, we, we have multiple generational households. Um, and so it's hard for anyone to isolate themselves. That continues to be a problem. But where um, I'm really hopeful, and one of the things I'm really proud of in my community is you don't see um, a lack of masks. When people go out, they're taking it seriously. They're wearing masks. I, I think they understand how harsh of a, a disease this is and how disproportionately affected Latinos in particular are. Um, and, and we know a, a vast majority of the hospitalizations and deaths, um, unfortunately, are our own people. And so I think that's understood and people are doing what they can to protect themselves with the reality that they have to go out and work or they have to go out um, and provide for their family and, and, and try to um, try to make the best of a really bad situation. Uh, you know, it was nice. We were commenting at, at the beach that it was a bunch of small little family units and you could tell, you know, and people were enjoying as they should um, in their household unit. Uh, cooking outdoors and eating outdoors and spending the day at the beach. And that's what we want people to do, you know, properly distance from everybody else because it's healthy. It's healthy to be out and exercising. And um, I worry about, you know, how many months we spent sheltering indoors and what that meant for kids. So it, it's a balance and um, it, it's a real struggle, I think. Uh, and it's going to continue to be a struggle um, for our communities because as we're saying, we're not in um, phase two. We're, we're seeing the resurgence in phase one. Um, and that's a that's a problem, and and we're going to have that compounded soon when um, the unemployment insurance uh, gets reduced at the end of July. We know it'll be reduced by six hundred dollars a week unless the federal government changes uh, kind of their course of action. That'll add an additional um, pressure onto communities like mine for those who aren't working, um, and it's going to be tough. But. We're hopeful uh, we can work with parks and that is an essential part. Um, when we're talking about, we don't know what'll happen in schools, right? And, and like you, I homeschooled my kids for a few months and I would pay any teacher any amount they wanted um, <laughs> to send my kids back. Mm -hmm. But the reality is we may have, schools may look different. We, they may not be in full time or they may not be in every day or you know we don't know quite what's gonna happen yet. Well, if that's the case, then we need to think about what is our physical education in, for communities like mine and how do we promote that? How do we ensure that if we have to close things down, that we have limited uses of parks and, and open space um, because those kids still need that physical education. And, and that's an essential part. And, I, and my worry was over the last few months, you had kids who were um, stuck inside an apartment or inside of a, a duplex or a fourplex without a yard, without getting out or a very small yard and um, with nowhere to, to really uh, do any kind of um, physical activity. And, and that just can't happen. We have to look at this as um, kind of a, a future, uh, well, well, hopefully, let me rephrase that. We not only have to look at it under COVID terms, but how this um, really is just uh, really magnifying what we see every day and the problems we see every day with the lack of park space and the lack of access to parks and the lack of access to um, resources. Right. And I think you hit on something that I think is, is really an interesting point is how do we think about our outdoor spaces and meeting the current needs of our children and our vulnerable communities and challenged communities. And if we're finding that, you know, who knows how our kids are going to go back to school in the fall or when in the fall and what that could look like. Um, but how do we think about outdoor classrooms again? How do we think about these spaces where we need to be in greater distance away from each other? We can't have 30 kids in a classroom at one point anymore. And we have these wonderful places in our own backyard that we have the jurisdiction to decide how we want to use them. And Californians have made it clear they want access to the outdoors. And you're right, we need to think about the, not just the physical health, but the mental health of how do we recover from this incredibly challenging time? And, uh, you know, what opportunities can we work together with our nonprofit partners, with our leaders like you and um, Californians alike to help, you know, open up that gap and, or, or sort of blow open that gap and think about making bridges and strong connections that are going to, that's going to make California stronger and thrive. Um, so with that, I'll have one final question. Um, you are always, um, and that's my daughter, Allison, she's popping in here, say hello. <laughs> this is um, what it's like to, you know, host yeah. an incredible conversation with our champion and have my daughter here. Um, so, you know, with that final question, uh, you know, I you are always a fighter. I always feel like you're fighting for people, you're fighting for families, you're fighting for parks in the most positive 
and um, uh, inspiring way. And I, I'd love to know how do we keep fighting for the things that we know matter most to Californians, like our parks and, you know, what money motivates you every day to get up and, you know, homeschool your kids and take them to the beach and do what you do. And, um, you know, how do you, how do you share and inspire our thousands of, of supporters to, to join you and join us in this fight together? Well, without sounding like too corny and it's going to sound corny, <laughs> but this is one thing that I found and was really important to me during this time is um, once we were actually able to go out and access, whether it was a trail or the beach or, um, you know, just nature in general, is to take that in as like self-care, right? Individually, all of us, like what we are able to experience is really important. And then to apply that to how many families out there are not able to and what we can do to change that. I mean, it's really made me think about, and some of the things I was frustrated with, it was, you know, in some ways, too long, but too quick to deal with this, I thought, well, why are we shutting down camping spaces? Camping spaces is somewhere that families could go during um, the shutdown that were safe. You're in a family unit, you're outdoors. Um, we should have figured out a better way, I think, to approach some of that and say, how do we get more families who wouldn't necessarily have the time that they have now or have the, the ability because their kids aren't in school or because, you know, they're not working to go and enjoy um, camping. We think a lot about the tourism industry as far as hotels and them coming back and bars and restaurants, but we should be thinking about our, our natural um, habitat in the same way. How, how do we um, re-inject uh, some energy into those places because they're naturally safer? They're a better place for us to be. They're they're naturally um, less polluting, right? We're we're not we're not using as much greenhouse gas emissions. We're not using as much energy. Um, it, it's a positive, and so I've spent a lot of time thinking about how we use this experience to really bring that. In, in, into further focus. Um, so often we lose focus of, and it's not just, of course the experience, because it is, but we know that our camps generate revenue for the surrounding areas as well, you know, and, and whether it's a small little store that's funding um, you getting your food or, or a gas station or a little restaurant, but it helps with that as well. And let's remember that this might be the safest form of staycations or, or stay at home or, you know, travel for, for the next, till we have a, 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 a vaccine. And so how mm -hmm. do we really push that and open that and see if there are more ways we can get people out and not limit that exposure. So um, I think a little, if we spend some time on ourselves, taking back in our natural um, surroundings, that it inspires us to do more for those families that haven't had that opportunity. Yeah. Well, wonderful. I couldn't agree more. They're, um, you know, yes, they are definitely a revenue generation. They're affordable for families in times where, you know, we can't afford to have these grand vacations or, or a day away from um, our jobs. And so how do we think about these accessible places that really provide these incredible benefits? So thank you so much for your time today. It's such a joy to talk with you and see your face again. Um, you know, it's been a while since we had business as usual and, and good luck with everything um, you. and your family and really appreciate it. So thank you. thank you everyone who uh, I say thank you for allowing your child to come on and not making a big deal <laughs> about it because that is my life and I love that I think that we need to normalize that more so thank you for sharing yes that. yes she does this often and <laughs> you know I it's I don't want to punish her for being a child who's like curious so thank you for <laughs> entertaining that um and everybody who watched this thank you for tuning in there's definitely ways you can take action and use your voice for parks Visit us at CalParks backslash act now um, and show your love and support for parks. So thank you and have a great day, Assemblywoman. Take care. Bye. Bye.